like to go over the six spiritual steps, and I would like you to just stick your hand up if you have a question. Obviously, in 29 minutes, I cannot give you the entire um, content of what's going to be in the book, which I hope will be out in a couple of months. It'll be called something. I don't know what. So you might want to just go to Amazon and search authors, because I don't know. But the first step is really understanding where these issues started. You know, in 25 years, I've had folks, mostly women, but also men, who have come to my office, and they've come in and they've said, I have no willpower. I can't do it. I've yo-yo dieted all my life. I gain back more than I lose. Anybody in here ever been on a diet? <laughs> yeah, or at least tried to watch your weight or whatever. Well, diets don't work. They cause weight gain. So I want you to know that. And actually, if I had my way, but people tell me no one would buy it, I would call my next book, You're Not a Failure, and It's Not Your Fault. That's my message. But people say, mm, two negative words, you don't want to use that. So I'll think of another way to say that. But I really do mean that. People are bombarded with information. Eat this. Oh, don't eat fat. Oh, you need fat. Oh, God, don't go near fat. Sugar's okay. Oh, my God, you take sugar. You're going to be, you know, searching for cocaine. <laughs> so you get all these different messages. They just pound you. And so what I've noticed happening as our obesity crisis is, of course, skyrocketing. You'd have to live in a cave not to, to know that. So as all of these people, the diet industry, are trying to help. People are getting bigger. If the diet industry products worked, they'd put themselves out of business. So they're not going to do that. It's an over $14,000 a day business or something like that. It's ridiculous. And so people say, well, there's, there's so much information. I don't know what to do. So they become apathetic. And they don't do anything. I'll just eat what I want. Well, here's part of the deal. That's social, one of the social reasons why people don't read, and physical reasons as well, the addiction component. But also, people overeat based on what they've gone through in their life. Now in the book, I, and I'm not here to promote the book today, but I, I'll refer to it because it's part of my presentation. I, I share 11 stories, nine women, two men, who talk about, it, and I brought these up from my own practice, these vignettes. But these stories illustrate different ways that these issues are formed in very, very early childhood. In my case, my mother was on a diet all her life. She gave my sister and I a drink called Metrical. Anybody heard of that? You have to? Ah, my hands are nodding. She gave my sister and I Metrical. For those of you who are unfortunate enough not to have ever had Metrical, which I don't think they make anymore. It's a milkshake, coffee or vanilla, I mean chocolate or vanilla. So I loved that idea. So we would have these milkshakes. And they were big. And we would sit there, the three of us, my sister, my mom, and I, and we would drink these milkshakes. I thought, hey, this is a dream come true. Milkshakes, I don't have to eat vegetables, I don't have to eat this other, I have milkshakes. <coughs> I want you to know, after like the first day, I had it up to here with milkshakes. And we did this for something like 12 days. It's a long time. I lost weight, so did my mother, so did my sister. I did like the experience, but it wasn't the milkshakes that I liked. Not after the first day. It was the connection with my mom and my sister. We never did anything together. So we were doing this together, and that felt really good. So I, I, now remember, I was like 11 or something. And when I see photos of myself, I was a skinny little bean when I was 11. But my mother always watched my body, make sure I don't want her to get fat. And my mother, with her eyes focused on me all the time, with her laser vision, watched me like a hawk. Now, we had a pretty good-sized house. If my mother was in the kitchen at that end, and I was in the bedroom at that end, and I tried to unwrap a little candy, all of a sudden, through the house, 
this voice would say, Denise, do you need it? My God, I flood with guilt and shame. I did need it. I needed it because of her. But I didn't say that. I, I know better. So that's one of the things with my mom. She always had us on diets. Other people grew up in a family where nobody paid attention to them. Other people grew up in families where nobody expressed emotion. That was my house too, by the way. People grew up in families where they were treated as if they were helpless, and every decision was made for them. So naturally, they were scared when they grew up. They didn't want to leave home. They didn't know what to do. So anyway, there are lots and lots of reasons, lots and lots of histories, people that were abused, people that were um, you know, in orphanages because nobody wanted them, people with all different kinds of scenarios. So once folks understand that, and they realize, wow, of course I'm overeating. Yeah, this is why. And it makes absolute sense. And when it does, they empower themselves to do something different. Whereas before, they had no idea. They just thought, I have no willpower. I'm guilty. I just can't stop, or whatever it is. So that's the first step. The next step is about forgiveness. And it's about forgiving people that have harmed you in any way, but it's even more about forgiving yourself. Because people feel badly often that they've abused their bodies. They feel badly about the way that they have not taken care of themselves. Well, this is what I think about that. So what? That's over, but it's not your fault. Move on. Because you know what? It's up to you to love yourself, to take care of yourself, it's up to you now. So forgive and, and move on. Now, I'm not saying forgive. For example, if you were abused, I'm not saying that it's OK that you were abused. I'm not saying forgive the one who abused you, it's OK. It will never be OK that you were abused. But what you do is you say, OK, I'm moving on. And I'm letting you go. I had a woman who came in to see me whose husband had cheated on her and left her with two children. She was single parenting, and boy, was she mad, rightfully so. She came to see me, and every week she would walk in, sit down, she'd go, and then she would blast just all this venom about this husband who had been so awful, did her so wrong. I said, okay, she has to vent. I'm, I'm cool with that. So that went on for a session, two, three, two months, three months, six months. I said, you know what? This isn't helping. This isn't helping her, and I don't like it. I'm sick of listening to her, to be perfectly honest. So I decided that I was going to go in there, and I was going to say to her, I can't work with you. Which, by the way, I think I've only maybe done once in 25 years. So I went in, and I, I said, you know, i got to tell you, your ex-husband is out there living his life having a blast. You're in here wasting your time and your money crabbing about him. And she looked at me. It was like this, you know, the cartoon, the light bulb? And she said, yeah, you're right. I said, so what are you going to do about that? Hmm. I guess I probably I should just let it go. And so she did. She let it go. And then she still saw me for a while, not much longer, maybe six months. But she pulled her life together. She created wonderful things for her children and for her. She started enjoying her life. She started having fun. And so forgiving means taking all that focus that's out here, the anger, all that agitation, going inside and saying, I have to take care of myself. I don't let that go. I'm not going to think about that. Let it go. If you have some issues that are just really, really, really eating away at you, pardon the pun, you may want to see somebody. If you have grief that you can't move beyond, you might want to see somebody. There are reasons to go to therapy, but not everyone needs to do that. Therapy is like a boat, and I want you to think about it that way. If you decide you want to talk to somebody and you want to go to therapy, get in the boat, do your therapy. While you're going across the river, you can get out of the boat. People forget to get out of the boat. People get into therapy, and sometimes 10 years later, they're still in the boat. Get out of the boat. It's your life. It's your time. 
It's up to you, as Pete said, march forth. Make it the best ever time in your life. So after the forgiveness piece, and now you have the understanding, you want to befriend yourself and befriend your feelings. And that's not easy for people, because in most of our families, we didn't express our feelings. We were not encouraged to do that. And you know, I don't know if you've seen, there's this cartoon. If I can ever see it again, I will grab it. It's this huge auditorium with whole thousands of people. And on the stage is a banner. Families, uh, people from functional families. One person in the whole audience. Because we all come from dysfunctional families in one way or another. Unless one of you is that one person. But the rest of you probably can relate to that. So you have to start paying attention to what you feel. Stopping, taking a breath, meditating. Go within yourself to name the feeling, access the feeling, and then express the feeling. And then you're releasing that. If you don't do that, you build up this huge mountain of anxiety and depression. Guaranteed, that's what will happen. So you need to have a flow of emotion. Something happens, you feel it, and you do whatever you need to do with it. Now, people will eat, for example, when they're lonely. They don't know they're doing this. But when you want to go and you want to grab your animal crackers and M&Ms, you might say, well, why do I want to do that? Now, if I had stopped and done that, I might have realized it's because I missed mom. And I might, or I might not, have chosen still to eat that. Because it's your body, you can eat anything you want. So, what's important is realizing this is what I feel. I feel sad. Call a friend. I feel angry. Let my friend know what I'm angry about. Talk it out. Conflict re resolution. Work that relationship back to a place where it feels okay. Or leave that relationship. Whatever you need to do. You know, I'm sad. Well, then cry. I'm tired. Take a nap. I'm thirsty. Get some water. And by the way, water is very important, which is why we have water here today. Staying hydrated is extremely important. And people mistake um, dehydration for hunger. So one of the little tips, and there are thousands of them, one of them is when you're feeling hungry and your appetite is um, kind of starting to rage, go ahead and eat. But before you do, if you know it's not time for you to eat, and, you, and I, by that I don't mean certain times of the day, but I, you, you have eaten, and you've eaten sufficient, you've had protein, you've had vegetables or fruits or whatever you're going to have, have a bottle of water before you go start eating other stuff very helpful. The next step, after you have started to express your feelings and made friends with your feelings, is befriending your appetite. And people say, uh-uh, my appetite is my enemy. <clears throat> well, I'm here to tell you that it doesn't have to be that way. You want to tame your appetite. And by that, what I mean is you want to follow your internal guidance system. So if you think about what I just said a minute ago, you have a feeling like donuts, cookies, whatever it is, whatever your feeling is, that's your internal guidance system. That feeling is coming to you to tell you that you need something. It's not those sugary products, but something that you need. So your feelings are your internal guidance system, and they come to you through your appetite, because your appetite is telling you, go eat junk, right? So when your appetite speaks to you, listen, because then you can tune into the feeling, your internal guidance system, and you will know what you really need. The next thing is make yourself a plan, a flexible plan, just for you. Just put categories, physical, emotional, social, spiritual, and write down things that you want to do to take care of yourself. And consult that list every day. You won't do it perfectly, please don't try. If you try to do anything perfectly, you'll just end up not being able to do it, and then you'll be a failure. And most of us know what it feels like to be a failure. It doesn't feel good. So make sure that you don't do that, that you make a plan that feels reasonable. And the last step that I talk about, or will be in the next book, make yourself a promise, and I'm actually going to have a contract that you can sign in the book, to nurture yourself, take the best care of yourself that you can, 
every single day.